In this video we talk about track 12 and for once look how great the glare that from time to time I get in my video looks. It's perfect. That's the sun toward which we're ascending. This is a roll and write adventure game in which the player or players will try to ascend uh, famous mountains and uh, well also try to score a lot of points in the process. So it is for a player, for players or a player because it has a standard solitary option meaning you can follow some extra rules and there is a way of playing the game because I mean who these days wants to play a game solitaire just to beat their previous score right I do and that's actually how I played it uh, I played it solitaire just in the in the boring version that I love so much I was try just trying to beat my previous scores but I also played uh, multiplayer now another thing it this is a Roll and write game with a legacy element. I think it's the first game that I encountered that has those two things together. And with legacy, usually we mean uh, elements that come in sealed envelopes, and you're allowed to open them only after achieving certain things, completing certain things, so that more things become available, and also uh, components that are physically alter the game after game. And the game has both. Uh, Trek 12 is really a legacy game in both senses. First because it comes with uh, first only a limited number of components that are available to you right away. In particular you have three pads representing three different uh, ascents and uh, by completing certain tasks you will be able you'll be allowed to open these envelopes there is a number of them that the game comes with and as I played the game uh, I opened several of those because I was able to complete the challenges this is the challenge from the basic game that I have not not completed yet and those envelopes will give you more pads and so more and different ascents and also will give you different components and other things. There's also an element of uh, legacy in the fact that there are certain components that you're supposed to write on to record certain things. For example, who the owner is and the owner of that component may change from game to game. It may be that there is a certain score that a player achieved in a game and then if I, and you've write on the back of the rule book. Now if players complete that achievement or they achieve better, they score better in the category, then you write that and that creates a different threshold. So it is a true legacy game but also because of that I have to be a little bit vague about certain things, just like in true legacy games. I can't tell you what you find in the what you find in the in the envelopes. Oh, incidentally, I played both the uh, again the base game and also one of the expansions, Track Twelve Plus One, and I can show you the basic pad that you find in the expansion in Track Twelve Plus One. Then you also you find envelopes. There are three envelopes in there. I was able to open one so far, uh, giving me this pad here. So again, and later I hope I can do these. And the track 12 plus one ascents, they follow the same idea, just with more challenging ascents. So to play the game, at the very least, you will need one of these per player. So you can play the standard game, which is just a single ascent and see who scores the most, or the campaign in which each player will complete three ascents. Again, with the basic things, that simply means each player will receive a sheet from each and that's the idea. With more paths like I have now, you can mix and match. You can even shuffle them like a deck of cards and then select and then draw random ascents. The basic idea remains the same. Also, um, the full game, not the intro game, you will use some of these item cards, which I'm not showing you because this is not the same deck that you have when you initially purchase the game, when you open the envelopes, who knows what happens, but I'm trying to avoid spoilers here. The general idea is that when you make a move that doesn't score you much, uh, in terms of points, the balancing mechanism is that you will draw, you will select one of these cards from a pool of available ones, and that will give you different advantages. So there's basically a nice balancing mechanism here that if you place numbers here, they give you a lot of points. Yay, good for you. If they're not so good, it's balanced by cards. We have two dice here. One goes from zero to five, and one goes from one to six. 
And when we have multiple ascents, uh, we play them in ascending order based on these numbers that you see that you see here, 65, 70, 75, for example. Now, a player, no matter whom, will roll two dice, and then based on those two dice, every player will write a number anywhere on their on their area. The first move you can do, you can place your number anywhere. You will place a single number using one of the options indicated here, which are a uh, limited in number. Once you use one of those options, you make a a mark there, and when that option is over, you cannot use it for that game anymore. So you'll be stuck with something else. For example, if I did that, I committed to write down the lower of the two numbers, and suppose that I do that. Now everybody's writing their number, and that's the way it is. Now, after after the first roll the next rolls, the next numbers that you write down need to be adjacent to a number that you wrote prior. And there are two ways in which you're going to score, so two things you're trying to uh, place your numbers uh, according to. One is you're trying to make lines, and that means that you're trying to place numbers uh, adjacent to one another, that they are one higher or one lower than the previous. And when you do that, then you can write a connection like that. And suppose that here, for example, I had roll such, and now I decide to use the highest of the two. I think that you can do is to subtract them from one another, add them, or multiply them. Multiply, you cannot go too crazy because you can only have a number up to 12. That's the highest number you can write. In other ascents, these ones with the uh, thicker border, you can only place a 6, 0 to 6 in there. So in this case, I decided to place the highest of the two, and so suppose I can do that. And now imagine that here, that's what I had rolled, booyah, and got started what I did, and I decide to add them together, mark that option, and now I have a three. So as you can see, when you place a number that is uh, one high or one lower than another one, you can place a connection there. And a number can only be part of one of these roped connections. But if I place a number that is the same as one that is next to it, I'm starting to, as what is called, making a camp or opening a zone, something like that. What you do when there are two numbers adjacent to one another, you kind of shade the background a little bit like that. And now they are part of an area that they will score together. Oh, six minus three is three, so I'm gonna keep building that idea. Now, as you can see, it's, uh, see, uh, again, each number can be part only of one of these row things, so I could not, say, get that one starting that way. Now, I don't have to be as good as I am right now. I could write down a nine there that is neither, neither uh, the same number, nor, um, nor one up or one down. It just sits there for now. But suppose that I did that, for example, see that I could do a 3 plus 1. 3 plus 1 is 4, add into this area, or 3, um, or just use the highest of the two. Suppose I want to add them, because I like the idea of a 4, and I place it here, and I'm making that connection there. And now I want to multiply them, only not. <laughs> so, but that's a general idea. So you continue to play until the whole thing is filled up. Until the whole thing is filled up. At that point, you score points. Each line, each line uh, such as this one, is worth the highest value in it plus one for each number attached to it. So this would be four, five, six, seven. Each camp, these shaded areas of the same value, are worth the value of the number in it, plus one for each bubble attached to it. So this would be three, four, five. Now, then you look at your, once you're done scoring them all, you look at your longest, longest road, I mean longest connection, and it scores a number of points equal to the number of connections. So seven numbers connected numerically, gives you 50, 15 points, pretty good. 
and the same here you look at the largest area so right now this would be three that would give me one point you look at the largest area like that and again that tells you how many points you score so you add those together if you collected cards during the game uh, during the, the round and you don't use them you can discard them and each will give you three points this is for areas that you were not able to connect in any way not the same area not shade and not connected then you draw a set face in it and they will score minus three points at the end of the game and as a general idea then you score points uh, in slightly different ways depending if it's a single game or a campaign and the player at the end of the single game or campaign with the highest score wins the game Track 12, no kidding, no exaggeration. This has quickly become one of my favorite roll and write games. It's, it's a genre that I like very much. I like the immediate, unmediated connection. I'm there drawing on my game. And then I, it teaches me to let it go because at the end that's it just goes. And uh, yeah, I still also play the ones with dry erase markers. But I have to say, I'm really starting to learn to enjoy the game that ends. I think I, I'm getting this idea that it's okay if a good game ends at some point. Um, and track 12 is disproportionately entertaining. I, I'm not sure how it does it. Why am I having so much fun when I'm putting numbers next to each other, you know, a two next to a three and a three next to a four or a four next to a four. That's the general idea. And yet, it is packaged with that limited space of opportunity um, because each operation that you can plug in, each action that you use to determine from the role, the actual number that you get, is so limited and so very interesting decisions there. Um, it's, it's such a tight economy of choice that you do have a push or luck element, but again, you have a range of decisions of how to optimize your chances. The push or luck element receives here a treatment that gives it, that elevates it to a whole other level of decision making while staying so simple, so slim, so intuitive. And to me, that is absolutely remarkable. Uh, just even when playing the same board, uh, you start from different locations. So you start by the same number, but crossing off a different kind of operation to get there. And sometimes you have a choice. Um, uh, it's one and one. I can choose uh, the lower, the lowest number, or the highest number, or the multiplication. So that kind of stuff. Um, you can even start with the same number and you will have a different experience because you can place it differently and then try to go for different things. I think you have, it's, it's, I think that's the idea of elegance. To me, the idea of elegance is when you have a game that gives you many interesting decisions with an absolute minimum of complication from the point of view of the rules of the mechanics. And track 12 is remarkable in that sense. And, and you don't have the feeling that you're doing the same action over and over again. Because each time you write down a number, you're opening some opportunities, closing some, committing to crossing out some operations, uh, possibly collecting a card. Uh, I don't think, I, I, I may not have mentioned this in the main segment. When you have an area of like two zeros or two ones or two twos, when you start a new one of those, that's when you collect a card that will give you a special ability or three extra points if you discard it at the end of the round. That's important because otherwise an area with two zeros will be worth one. Remember the value in it plus one for each bubble attached to it. So that's not much. Um, but if I get a card that allows me to reroll or to set a die to a certain number of other or to skip a number, other kind of things will happen. And the legacy effect also works very well, especially when, as I was playing the game Solitaire, I guess myself, that was a good, that was good because I didn't have to worry about the score. Uh, I was just trying to, to produce whatever result I needed to be, to be able to open the next envelope. In retrospect, legacy is almost like disappointing or underwhelming is that all that there is you you sequester some elements in a seal envelope you tell me you can't open it. although i bought it it's my own money i know i can't open it and somehow there's a certain magic a certain mystique to it and yes the game becomes more exciting and satisfying 
Uh, maybe, you know, when you were kids and you got a sticker for uh, as a reward and then as an adult you think that's silly, then you turn around and you play a legacy game where you can open an envelope as a reward. Again, there's just something about the human reward system that legacy legacy mechanic has captured. But definitely was super fun to open these envelopes and discover new paths, new things, new rules. If one thing, maybe that's, that's the idea that if you're playing competitive, you're trying to create certain patterns to score as many points as possible, and that makes it, in some cases, hard to achieve some of those objectives. I know that some games, I just forgot about the scoring. I just went for opening the envelope. And maybe that's, that's the idea that, you know, well, then play solo, open more envelopes, and then bring those paths or those other elements that you discover to the event with your friends. I also played it with adult friends who also enjoyed it. I didn't play it with my kids yet, but I think they will also enjoy it. Trek 12 has, has a certain magic. It's very addictive in, in, in a good sense because a game lasts not too long, if you're playing, especially if you're playing a single sheet and you play solitaire. Again, you'll just be playing one after the other. Again, it has a proper solo mode, or you can try the poor man solo mode, which is beat your previous score, which to me, that's 100% okay. If nothing else, because these days, if I can play a game without reading certain rules, uh, I'll play that way. And yeah, of course, you had, well, I read, I read the rules for the solo system, and I thought, oh, I can play with my, with beating my previous score. And I had so much fun doing it that way. Track 12 is a heck of a fun game. Easily one of my favorite Roll and Write games. I'm very excited to see other games in the system because now the general idea I think can be expanded with so many different maps and options and things. The expansion uh, Track 12 plus one also gives you some other interesting challenges, more complex things to do, but that's okay because by the time you get there, the game is trained in the basic stuff and at that point you'll be able to get that extra level of challenge. But definitely, very high endorsement from me for Trek 12, an absolutely excellent game.